Next, I would like to call our next speaker, Bill Lewis. So his speech is from the Storytelling Manual, speech number five, Bringing History to Life. He'll be speaking for 10 to 12 minutes in a speech entitled Patrick Henry. Please welcome Bill Lewis as James Madison. Thank you so much, Madam. Mm -hmm. The essence of government is power. And power, lodged as it must be in human hands, will always be liable to abuse. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. My fine fellow citizens and any foreign-born aliens who might be among us, greetings. My name is James Madison, fourth president of the United States. I have returned from 181 years of quiet repose in the grave because I'm very concerned about the future of my country. I thought perhaps if I returned and talked about the issues that we had back in the founding time, that it might give you some insight as to what you might do now in your times. Let me tell you a little bit about government in power. All of government is about one thing, power, and power's twin sister, whose name is... <laughs> Money, of course. If you look at any legislation, if you look at any act, the only thing that you should look at is who is gaining power, who is gaining money. And that's how it was back in our days. As you probably remember, 1765, the Stamp Act, we were rebelling, we were angry at the British. They blocked the ports, and we got angrier. It's 1773, of course. You folks up here threw the tea into the harbor because you refused to pay a tax that you did not have representation for the creation of. And then, March 23rd, 1775, Patrick Henry was a wild and passioned individual born in 1763. He was a mesmerizing speaker, powerful, insistent, obnoxious, self-grandizing, and inspirational. He liked to dress in buckskin with wool stockings and an unpowdered wig. He fashioned himself quite the outdoorsman, the backwoodsman, which he was not really, but he liked that imagery. <laughs> and now, I need someone who is loud and obnoxious, who would be kind enough to read the part of Patrick Henry for me. Is do I have a volunteer? Me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Come forward, Matt and Mr. Henry. Okay, your part is here. You will have a little bit of work together, you and I. So, we are now in the House of Burgess, March 23rd, 1775, and Patrick Henry is about to make the greatest speech of his life. Okay, gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have if life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. Continue. Okay. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> And wild pandemonium broke out! Huzzah! Oh, cheering! Patrick Henry, you are not done. <laughs> and that is what happened. His speech shot like a lightning bolt across the colonies. A month later, on April the 20th, 1775, one day after Lexington and Concord, Lord Dunsmore, the royal governor of Virginia sent troops to Williamburg to take the gunpowder from the armory. 
600 armed men gathered in Fredericksburg, threatening to march against the British, but after some consideration, the wiser heads, George Washington among them, suggested that we were not powerful enough. Patrick Henry, however, went back to Hanover and made his great speech. Men of Hanover, who will march with me against the British? Me. me. I will march. <laughs> yes, yes, and so they went crazy. These men were wild, and indeed they marched down 150 men with John, uh, with Patrick Henry. I was determined, James Madison, that my brother and I should be there if there was going to be fighting. We jumped on our horses and hurried after them, and we were too late. When the Hanover militia approached the city, Henry demanded that Lund Lord Dunsmore return the powder. It is by British law that the government cannot confiscate any possessions without just compensation. I see no compensation. Lord Dunsmore did not want a repeat of Lexington and Concord, and so he wrote a bill of exchange for 330 pounds. We have not the power, but we have a victory. The governor has recognized our rights and our determination to protect them. He fears us. He shall not tread upon us again without consequences. Woo! <laughs> Huzzah! Uh, lots of huzzahing. <laughs> Then we rode up, Ambrose and I. Remember, I was 23 years old. I was five foot four, 100 pounds, full of enthusiasm and had no experience whatsoever. Colonel Henry, Colonel Henry James Madison Jr. of Orange County, California. My brother and I had hoped to ride with you in case that there were fighting that we could stand beside you. And you may soon do exactly that. There will be war, and it's, it shall not be long. I can see strong determination in your face. I expect great things from you, young Madison. I rode home with my heart fluttering. Patrick Henry saw greatness in me. The following years, I was elected to the House of Delegates. And Patrick Henry remained an inspirational vision. He became governor. I became his aide. I was on his privy council. And then he suggested that we should pass a law stating that everyone should have to contribute for the upkeep of Christian religion. And I said, no, no, no. We must not have the government involved in religion in any way, shape, or form. The freedom of man's mind must be protected we fought over the bill, and my great hero became my great opponent. And so, in June of 1788, the battle for ratification of the Constitution came to Virginia. On one side, the young kids, myself, George uh, Edmund Randolph and George Marshall. On the other side, it was Patrick Henry and George Mason. And so, in the beginning of the great debate in now the Hall of Delegates, Wednesday the 4th, June 1788, Patrick Henry spoke. I consider myself as the servant of the people of the Commonwealth, as a sentinel over their rights, liberty, and happiness. I represent their feelings. They are exceedingly uneasy, being brought from that state of full security which they enjoyed to the present delusive appearance of things. The people were enmeshed by his words. They grew apprehensive when they warned about the dangers of the Constitution. They grew angry when he accused us of having written it behind closed doors. They followed every dip and flow of his dialogue. We struck back with logics and facts. We quoted the Federalist Papers extensively, and they had nothing to quote. We were Federalists. We were for something. They were anti-Federalists. They were only opposed to something. Only opposed to things? I say that you do your fellow citizens a disservice by lacking the Bill of Rights. 
what use is a bill of rights? It's as weak as a parchment it is written on. A mere piece of paper will not stop a tyrant. But it is essential that man's rights be spelled out loudly and clearly. Without such a document, I shall rally the entire state against your cursed constitution. <laughs> Fine then. I shall support a bill of rights. Let us pass the constitution as it stands today, and I guarantee that a bill of rights shall be amended in the first session of Congress. What? Now he's going to support a bill of rights? He has stolen my strongest weapon and turned it against me. That Madison is a very dangerous man. We fought over each paragraph of the Constitution. We spent a solid three weeks debating and talking all night and talking more. On June 24th, the final day of discussion, Patrick Henry rose and in his magnificent voice, he tells you of important blessings which he imagines will result to us from the adoption of this system. I see the awful immensity of the dangers with which it is pregnant. I see it. I feel it. Beings of a higher order anxiously concerning our decision. We have it in our power to secure the happiness of one half of the human race. And boom! A giant flash of lightning struck across the sky, rattling the pardon of the People were frightened and scared. What could this possibly? Was God expressing his concerns? And if so, which concerns were he expressing? As it was, after the deluge, the power of and the influence of Mr. Henry declined. The next day we had the vote, 89 for, 79 against. And Virginia, being the most populous state, and the tenth state to ratify the Constitution guaranteed that we, the United States of America, would be a country. Thank you so much, Mr. Henry. And thank you, fellow citizens and most welcome guests. Huzzah!